Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Welcome. Yes, we can. Thank you so much for uh, if you uh, were able to join us a little bit earlier uh, to watch our little ten-minute story. That's a thirty. Uh, that is um, thirty minutes. Uh, excuse me, ten minutes of uh, that shows thirty years of our, some of our work that we've done around the country, and it uh, always makes me tired just looking at all the stuff that we've done. Uh, we are so blessed to have wide and varied opportunities to serve uh, educators and folks around the country. So hope you had a chance to explore that a little bit. Uh, we are celebrating our 31st anniversary right now, and uh, we're going to get things started. Uh, to begin with, uh, first, I would like to welcome you to Hamlin University. Hamlin University is founded in, in 1854. That is 167 years ago, and I was reflecting a little bit tonight that I imagine that uh, Reverend Hamlin could not imagine that uh, 167 years later, we might be Zooming and students and uh, community members and faculty uh, are learning in a distance uh, in a very far off strange world. Of course, Minnesota was that far off and strange world in 1854. Um, our center uh, has been around, for, as I said, uh, for 30 years. My name is Tracy Ferdine and I'm the director. I have been here for 28 of those years. And uh, it's been a joy to be part of the whole process. Uh, we are have a mission, and it's, it's relatively simple. We, we put this together uh, my first year here, and we came up with the idea to foster environmental literacy and stewardship in citizens of all ages, pretty broad, pretty wide. Uh, and I think one of the things that we we're able to do uh, is to think of in, multi, in multiple forms, multimedia. So we have professional development, we create multimedia tools. We made the first <laughs> website. This thing called the web was starting up at Hamlin University. John Shepard made the first, uh, second website. I'll, I'll give uh, uh, Mr. Kornicki, uh, Dr. Kornicki, the first uh, one. Uh, we create K-12 curriculum through our work with the Will Steger Foundation and Will Steger's work. We uh, came out of that uh, mold. And uh, we've also done community outreach. And I think the exciting thing that I see with this is that they come together. They come together, and if you make a tool that works for fifth graders, it works very well for legislators. And uh, if you have something that gets a point across to uh, a family, it might work for a grandpa as well as a, a, a grand a child. So we are so pleased that we have this interdisciplinary approach, uh, combining the arts and the environment and, and civics and science. And I think that's even more needed uh, needed more today than it ever has been. Um, I uh, over the you know, my time here, I, you certainly things have gotten interesting in our world about the, how science is viewed. Um, tonight we come together and we are going to engage uh, some storytelling. Oh, my sister's on this. Uh, so we are going to <laughs> yeah, engage Yeah, because she, she always gets the library things. Uh, let's see, there's someone's there. Uh, we're gonna be doing storytelling with Waters to the Sea stories. Waters to the Sea is an initial program we made many years ago. And it's a way of thinking about how systems work together. So we uh, started this uh, presentation last fall and it's become very popular. Uh, in fact, uh, we, uh, we are limited tonight by 100 folks uh, because uh, that's what our, our, our format allows us. We had 150 folks sign up just in the last uh, 24 hours. So it's been, that has been very interesting for us. Uh, we are certainly gonna make this presentation available online uh, uh, tomorrow so people can watch if they can't get in tonight. Uh, but tonight we are going to be doing Waters and Sea Stories, The Future of the Mississippi River, with John Anfinson giving a presentation about, uh, the, uh, the, about the content aspect. And the other thing that we always do at these programs is to allow uh, John Shepard, our associate uh, 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 professor and assistant director, to share some of the multimedia tools that uh, we might use in a classroom, we might use in a, in a, a public setting, and uh, uh, explore a little bit of that. Uh, we will be taking questions after those two have presented. We should get this wrapped up by about 7.10, 7.15. And uh, if you can hold your questions, please place those into the chat. And uh, I will, uh, Sarah and I are going to manage those. Uh, um, please keep your mic on mute. As we heard, that's always a good thing with our Zoom protocol. Uh, you may turn your video on, but uh, you might have better reception of our materials if you have it off. Uh, and as I said, the webinar is recorded and we're going to try to get this out. Uh, hopefully with even before a week. Uh, and there are going to be some uh, actions that you can take, some surveys and whatnot. We'll have a link to those in that as well. So uh, as we keep going forward, I would now like to thank Sarah Robertson for her assistance in managing this. 
She's done a great job of pushing this her, forward, hurting the cats, you might say. Uh, but I'd also like to give a great welcome to uh, Dr. John Anfinson, retired superintendent of the Mississippi River and Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, and John Shepard, our assistant director and associate professor. So with that, I am going to turn it over to, uh, to John Anfinson to get us started. Uh, is there anything else, uh, John uh, Shepard or uh, uh, Sarah, that I missed? Okay. Here we go. John is muted. Sorry, everybody, I lost um, when I went to uh, share my screen. I uh, lost the ability to unmute. So I'm gonna try do it again here. Sorry for the delay. Can you hear me okay now? I can hear you fine. Awesome, sorry for that. Um, so I wanna thank Tracy and John Shepard and the Hanlon Center for Global Environmental Education for this opportunity to reignite a really important conversation. And for the first time since the Twin Cities began, we have a chance to reconsider our relationship with the Mississippi River. We can step back from old visions and their concrete and steel embodiment and choose a different relationship and attach new meaning to the river here. Or we can tweak and reaffirm those old visions. When the Upper Mississippi River, St. Anthony, when the Upper St. Anthony Falls Lock closed to navigation on June 10th, 2015, commercial shipping ended at the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam and at Lock and Dam 1. Any towboat that went through those two locks and dams had to get through the upper lock to get to a barge terminal. So the Corps of Engineers now wants to leave all three sites. Excel Energy owns the, most of the dam at St. Anthony Falls. So removing that dam would destroy the falls and that can't be done. But we have a choice about whether to keep the other two locks and dams or to take them out. And that conversation is really just beginning. We expect the Corps of Engineers to start their disposition study for the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam and Lock and Dam 1 early next year. In 2018, American Rivers made removing the lower two locks and dams a national priority and launched a campaign to restore the gorge to the rapids it once was. The gorge is a river between St. Anthony Falls and the Minnesota River. On April 10th, 2018, American Rivers declared the gorge one of America's 10 most endangered rivers for the opportunity that could be lost. Others like the rowing clubs and those who prefer the lake like gorge wanna keep the locks and dams. Brookfield, which operates the hydroelectric plants at both sites, needs the locks and dams and will be a key voice in whatever, whatever happens. You know, the sooner they state their intentions, the clearer the path forward will become. Most, including Friends of the Mississippi River and the National Parks Conservation Association, haven't take a, taken a position. And they want answers to many of the questions, some of which I will raise tonight. From its earliest days, Minneapolis <clears throat> commercial interests wanted their city to be the head of navigation on the Great River. And they were willing to do whatever was necessary in the gorge to make that happen. When hydroelectricity came of age in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, damming the gorge fulfilled another vision, another need. When hydro and so the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam and Lock and Dam 1 are really legacies to past dreams, needs, and values with regard to the Mississippi River and the environment. So what are your dreams and needs for this special reach? And how do they reflect who we are in the 21st century? To choose between keeping the locks and dams and removing them requires knowing as much as possible about what either choice means. Tonight, I'm gonna to begin, just begin building the context for that choice for you. For those not from the Twin Cities, don't think you are simply observers. 
The gorge lies at the center of the 72 mile Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, a unit of the National Park System. And where national parks are concerned, they belong to all Americans. All Americans have a right to you know, have their voice heard about that. So first, I wanna introduce you to the Mississippi River in the Twin Cities. There's a lot of people on this call who aren't from the Twin Cities area. So I have to set this context. And I can't even assume that those from the Twin Cities know the geography of this conversation. So nowhere along its 2,350 mile course does the Mississippi River change more dramatically in such a short distance as it does in the Twin Cities. The river here has three unique reaches, the Prairie River, the Gorge, and the large floodplain river. The Mississippi enters the Twin Cities metropolitan area as a prairie river from the north. Throughout this reach, the land runs up the river's banks, not bluffs, and there's little floodplain and some small islands. The Prairie River ends at St. Anthony Falls. The second reach is the gorge. The gorge stretches for eight and a half miles from St. Anthony Falls to the mouth of the Minnesota River. And this is the only place on the Mississippi River where it falls so quickly over such a short distance and through such a tight and narrow canyon. The Mississippi drops 110 feet through the three locks and dams the Corps wants to get rid of. The river falls 49 feet at Upper St. Anthony, 26 feet at Lower St. Anthony, and 36 feet at Lock and Dam 1. The large floodplain river begins at the mouth of the Minnesota River. This is the river of Mark Twain, river of steamboats. It's the river that most people know. It's characterized by a broad valley, a wide floodplain with many side channels, backwater lakes, wetlands, and wooded islands. So the gorge then is this tiny, isolated, easy to miss reach when you're considering the whole Mississippi River. But what was the gorge like before locks and dams? What might it look like if we remove them? We have three re key resources that can help us answer these questions. There's historic accounts of travel, there's Corps of Engineers records, and there's photographs. So let me just set this context from the historic perspective. Zebulon Pike was the first American explorer to ascend the gorge. On September 26, 1805, his party left the Minnesota River confluence early in the morning and arrived at St. Anthony Falls after he complained much labor in passing through the rapids. It took them all day to go eight and a half miles. And he explains why. He says that below St. Anthony Falls, the river falls through a continued bed of rocks with a descent of at least 50 feet perpendicular in the course of half a mile. For a distance of 11 miles by water, he added, there's almost one continued rapid aggravated by the interruption of 12 small islands. He thought the entire gorge should be considered St. Anthony Falls. The rapids mentioned in this day's march, he argued, might properly be called a continuation of the falls of St. Anthony, for they are equally entitled to this appellation with the falls of the Delaware and Susquehanna. Twelve years later, on July 16, 1817, Major Stephen Long confirmed Pike's account. The rapids below the falls of St. Anthony, he observed, commence about two miles above the confluence and are so strong that we could hardly ascend them by rowing, poling, sailing with a strong wind all at the same time. About four miles up the rapids, he continued, we could make no headway by all these means and were obliged to substitute the cordal. And what they had to do is they had to tie a rope around the front of the boat, put the rope around a tree, and pull the boat up the gorge from tree to tree. Given its unique physical character, the gorge was much different ecologically. In 1766, English colonist Jonathan Carver visited St. Anthony Falls. And there are two small islands there, he said, right below the falls. And one was Spirit Island. He said it was about an acre inside and had many eagles' nests on it. And he said the reason for all the eagles' nests were all the fish trying to migrate up above the falls. Despite the difficulty, or maybe because it Pike took so long to get up the gorge, he comments on more than just the rapids. The shores have many large and beautiful springs issuing forth, which he wrote, form small cascades as they tumble over the cliffs into the Mississippi River. The timber is generally maple. Then in a statement that caught me by surprise, he says, this place we noted for the great quantity of wild fowl. In 1823, members of Stephen Long's second expedition ate bass at the falls, 
and reported that a catfish weighing 142 pounds had been caught there. So obviously the gorge was much different ecologically from what it is today. Consider this. St. Anthony Falls was the first place above the Gulf of Mexico that blocked fish migration. Can you imagine what a gathering place for fish it must have been? Whether high or low, navigation through the gorge ranged from treacherous to impossible. By the late 1850s, St. Paul had established itself as the head of navigation on the Mississippi River, with steamboats coming and going over a thousand times. But few pilots dared to travel through the gorge to Minneapolis. And the voyage of the Fanny Harris may explain why. The Fanny Harris nearly sank in the gorge trying to make its way down from Minneapolis. In what an account of the trip described as a very crooked channel winding between reefs of solid rock with an eight to 10 mile current. And coming down the gorge, the Fanny Harris struck a rock so hard it tore off one of the two wing rudders and the Special Rapids pilot panicked and left the wheel. Luckily, there are two experienced pilots on board and one of them jumped to take it. Had he not, the account says, the boat would have been smashed to kindlings. Unaware of what was happening in the pilot house, the engineer kept feeding the boilers, as the pilot said, to drift for one minute in that white water would pile us up on the next reef below. For six miles, the writer said, they twisted among the reefs under a full head of steam, which was necessary to give a steerage way in such a current. All along the gorge at low water lay small pockets of floodplains such as the ones in this image. What I want you to think about is how physically and ecologically different the gorge must have been from what you know it is today. Structurally you had the rapids, the gravel bars and boulders and the dozen or so islands. The river rose and fell with a natural pulse. Minneapolis however desperately wanted to be the head of navigation and boosters there started pushing for locks and dams as early as the 1850s. But was damming, was damming the gorge really necessary? I've given you some anecdotal accounts, but what's the hard evidence for that need? Fortunately, the US Army Corps of Engineers documented the gorge in detail. Between 1866 and 1895, the Corps surveyed the gorge multiple times and each time confirmed that they would need locks and dams to make it navigable. Yet, Minneapolis interests wanted the Corps to begin work right away and begin removing boulders and dredging the channel. And by doing this work, the Corps really tells us exactly what the, the gorge was like. I'll present just enough from their accounts to give you a sense of what the natural gorge was like. On April 29, 1890, a Corps survey crew boarded a skiff just below St. Anthony Falls and headed down the river to assess, as the report says, the feasibility of improving navigation by the removal of rocks and boulders. They found, according to the report, a very swift current. For the greater part of the way to Meeker Island, a much, mu there was much rough water, indicating the existence of many rocks and boulders. The least depth of water found was three feet. But this was April when the river was normally running high at its highest of all time for the year, because. April really saw the most of the spring snow melt. Meeker Island is an anchor point in the gorge, so you need to know where it is. It lay about three and a half miles below the falls and nearly five miles above the confluence. And the Marshall Avenue Bridge, as named in St. Paul, or the Lake Street Bridge, as it's called in Minneapolis, is another key landmark. It crosses the Mississippi River about the midpoint of the gorge and marked a fundamental transition. I'm gonna to refer to it as the Marshall Avenue Bridge, not because I'm taking St. Paul's side in this, but that's the way the Corps refers to it in their reports. So showing that small boats could venture through the gorge, the Corps reported that on May 1st, 1890, the steam launch Ada, which only drew about two feet of water, went to Minneapolis without difficulty. Drawing two feet means that the boat's bottom was only about submerged about 24 inches below the surface. It was a different matter for larger boats, and by larger, I mean boats drawing three feet of water. On June 26, 1890, the snag boat General Barnard made it just beyond Meeker Island, where the rocks blocked further passage. The General Barnard drew 39 inches. Based on their survey work and attempts to navigate the gorge, the Corps broke it into three distinct reaches. The first was from Minneapolis. The first was from the Minneapolis Steamboat Landing, which lay about a mile below the falls, to the Marshall Avenue Bridge. 
From the boat landing to Meeker Island, the Corps said, the bottom of the river is composed of boulders mixed in places with coarse gravel, and added that it may be likened to a street paved with rubble stones, so closely are the boulders packed. The lower limb of the boulders, the Corps reported, is the Marshall Avenue Bridge. So the second reach begins at the Marshall Avenue Bridge. And from there down to about Meha Creek, they found fewer and smaller boulders and more sand and gravel. And then starting at Meha Creek is the third reach, which is about two miles above the Minnesota River. And here the Corps says, the sand was more gravel with a scattering of boulders. While the engineers firmly believed that it would take locks and dams to you know, really get meaningful com commerce to Minneapolis, the city grew impatient and convinced Congress to authorize the Corps to begin removing the obstructions. In the Rivers Harbors Act of 1890, the Corps provided the Corps with $50,000 to begin extracting rocks and dredge the gorge. And on October 16th, the Corps begins the work. It would only last three seasons, but it would provide really valuable information. During this brief period, the Corps began dismantling the rock formations causing the worst of the rapids. Their goal was to create a channel 200 feet wide and three feet deep at extreme low water. I'll give you some examples of the Corps' work so you can get an idea of what they found and what they changed. Between the Franklin Avenue Bridge and the Shortline Bridges, the Corps recorded they were removed by blasting 76 granite boulders, five pieces of ledge rock. The boulders vary in size from one and a half feet to six feet in diameter. The ledge rock from four feet to eight feet by 15 feet on one face. In other words, there were some really large boulders. With few exceptions, the engineers continued, all these rocks were so completely broken up as to leave no trace. Wherever large pieces of rock remained after blasting, they were either hauled ashore or further broken up by blasting. And they concluded it is thought that all of the most dangerous rocks within the channel limits between these bridges have been removed. In 1891, the Corps moved boulders downstream of the Marshall Avenue Bridge to the side of the channel and placed dredge material they took out of the channel behind Meeker Island. When they began dredging the lower reaches of the gorge, they found that the riverbed consisted of sand, coarse gravel, shell rock, and boulders less than a foot in diameter. They dredged these materials out and placed them in a slough behind Fisherman's Island. I haven't found a map that shows Fisherman Islands, but the point here is that the Corps is starting to fill in behind those dozen islands in the gorge. At the upper end of the gorge, the Corps focused on establishing a channel to the Franklin Avenue Bridge, from the Franklin Avenue Bridge to the Minneapolis Steamboat Landing. Through this reach, they removed the largest and most dangerous rocks. I got one more strong example here for detail. Below the Franklin Avenue Bridge, the Corps took out 2,000 945 pieces of rocks, totaling 976 solid cubic yards. They used 515 pounds of dynamite to blow up 136 rocks. They placed the rock remains in the slough behind Meeker Island. I'm not expecting you to remember all these details I'm giving you, but what I want you to know is all these details are there in the Corps of Engineers records. The Corps also began dredging the channel below Franklin Avenue Bridge at the foot of the rapids where they reported the dredge made four cuts, varying in length from 300 to 500 feet, opening a channel not 200 feet wide, but just 70 feet wide and three feet below um, at low water. In his 1893 report, Corps headquarters, uh, Corps headquarters, Major Alexander McKenzie offered this assessment of the Corps' work in the gorge to date. With a channel as now existing of sufficient depth and free from obstruction, it was found by actual trial to be very difficult, if not impossible, for large boats to stem the current at the swifter portions of the rapids between Meeker's Island and Minneapolis. In fact, the velocity of the current is such as to practically prevent profitable navigation. Consequently, the Corps headquarters direct the St. Paul District to conduct detailed surveys in preparation for locks and dams. And by the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1894, Congress approved damming the gorge. So in three short years, the Corps made substantial changes to the river's physical character. They had blasted away the largest boulders, had begun filling in the backwater channels. Fortunately, we have the price precise details for the, where they did this work. And just as the St. Paul District began working on the locks and dams, 
The Corps Mississippi River Commission map makers reached the gorge. And between 1895 and 1899, they mapped it in amazing detail. The maps confirm the St. Paul District's reports. This section of the Meeker Island reach labels the boulders, the gravel, bed, river bed. It shows the depth across the channel at regular intervals and the coffer dam where the Meeker Island Lock and Dam was under construction. It also shows on the maps, like this one, a dozen or so islands on the river, especially the larger ones below the Marshall Avenue Bridge. As the Corps began planning for locks and dams, a new force motivated flooding the gorge. In 1881, a consortium of millers and others formed the Minnesota Brush Electric Company in, at St. Anthony Falls and built a small hydroelectric plant. They ran, they ran lines of some bars and businesses. And on September 5th, 1882, they lit them with electricity generated by the first hydroelectric power central station in the United States. In 1895, the Pillsbury Washburn Company completed the Main Street Station at the Falls. And in 1897, William V. LaBar built the Lower Hydro Station at the Lower St. Anthony Falls. This structure recast the river's landscape below St. Anthony Falls by permanently flooding the rapids where fish had once struggled to climb above the falls. These projects demonstrated the gorgeous potential for hydroelectric power generation. But the Lock and Dam project was too far along. Lock and Dam 1 was to have a lift of only 13.3 feet and the Meeker Island Lock and Dam a lift of 13.8 feet. The lift is the difference from above the dam to below it. The two locks and dams guaranteed Minneapolis would become the head of navigation, but the short lift ensured that neither St. Paul nor competing millers would get the hydropower. Many saw this as a missed opportunity. In 1907, the Corps completed the Meeker Island Lock and Dam and had begun building Lock and Dam 1. Up to this point, they spent over a million dollars in, in money on the locks and dams, but the Meeker Island Lock and Dam had a short life. Despite the costs, the desire to capture the hydroelectric power potential of the gorge won out. And Congress authorized a new project only three years after the dam was completed at Meeker. It called for the partial demolition of the Meeker Island Lock and Dam and raising Lock and Dam 1 from 13.3 feet to 36 feet so it could serve navigation and hydroelectric power. In 1912, the Corps destroyed the top five feet of the Meeker Dam took off the lock gates and walked away. If you question your ability to shape the future of the gorge, consider the Meeker Island Lock and Dam. The argument to revamp the project was that times had changed and there was a higher and better purpose for the gorge. In 1917, the Corps completed Lock and Dam 1, replacing the rapids above with a reservoir. So now 6.3 miles of the gorge's eight and a half miles are now flooded. In 1924, the Ford Motor Company finished the hydroelectric plant at the dam. One other dam flooded the last portion of the gorge. In 1930, the Corps opened Lock and Dam 2, about 32 miles downstream of Lock and Dam 1, which backed water up to the Lock and Dam at 1, turning the last part of the gorge into a reservoir. For about two miles below Lock and Dam 1, however, the tailwater effect of Lock and Dam 2 is minimal. So for Minneapolis to become the head of navigation, shipping still had to get above St. Anthony Falls. In 1930, Congress authorized the building of locks and dams three through 26 from Red Wing, Minnesota, about 60 miles below the cities to above St. Louis. Feeling they had been cut out, Minneapolis lobbied for and got the Upper Harbor Project added in 1937. And under this project, the Corps completed the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam in 1956, in the upper Sandy Falls Lock and Dam in 1963, making navigation above the falls finally possible. So in 1963, Minneapolis had the navigation system it had so long dreamed of, but that dream never came true. In 2014, Congress mandated the permanent closure of the upper lock. While many think Congress did so to stop upstream, navig mi upstream migration of invasive carp, carp were just the trigger. The failure of navigation and new visions and opportunities for the land above the falls were the real cause. So commercial navigation to hydropower created the gorge we have today, eliminating the rapids and swift moving river that once coursed through it, along with the ecological abundance and complexity. 
When damned, the trade-offs were either considered well worth it or not considered at all. Today, we can't ignore this aspect of the conversation. What are the trade-offs of keeping or removing the locks and dams? And are they worth it to us today? An underlying premise of this conversation is that the Corps of Engineers will pursue and achieve the authorizing both the Lower St. Falls Lock and Dam and Lock and Dam 1 and try to dispose, dispose of both of them to the extent they can. Once they succeed, other entities will have to take over ownership and responsibility for all or parts of the site. For anything they can't dispose of, they will spend absolutely minimal funding on it. I've heard of no compelling arguments for why the Corps should stay at these two sites. Many aspects of what I'm gonna say next, the Corps of Engineers is gonna to have to address in their disposition study, but they won't cover everything. They're gonna examine what's relevant to their actions, the authorizing the navigation mission and disposing of the locks and dams to some other entity. They will either produce an environmental assessment or a more intensive study called an environmental impact statement. But the Corps is not gonna weigh the pros and cons of dam removal. They're not gonna pick one or side or the other. That's our conversation to have. Friends of the Mississippi River, the National Parks Conservation Association and American Rivers are going to begin a public engagement effort to make sure there's a robust and informed conversation about the future of these two sites. Independently, McAllister College is conducting a survey to find out what people know about the core process and what they would like to see happen. We hope to have at the end of the presentation a link to a survey that McAllister would like to do, a very short survey of about 10 questions. Now I'm gonna look at what keeping the locks and dams might mean and at what removing them might mean. In examining both alternatives, I'm gonna briefly cover six areas. Phys the physical character, recreational use, economic concerns, environmental matters, adaptive reuse, aesthetics and social concerns. And each one of these topics is a presentation unto itself. So I'm not gonna do any of them justice. So what will keeping the locks and dams mean? As you've learned, the gorge is a series of three reservoirs. Lock and dam number two at Hastings and its reservoir will remain under any alternative. While the reservoir extends up to lock and dam one, the effect of the gorge in the gorge is minimal as demonstrated by the strong current running through the last two miles. At 5.9 miles, Pool 1 floods the longest portion of the gorge, and the 36-foot drop is the third highest among all the locks and dams on the Mississippi River. After the Lower St. Anthony Falls Pool, it's the steepest drop over the shortest distance. But the reservoir, with the reservoir, you can't see that slope. It's imperceptible. At Lock and Dam, at one, I mean, at, at one and a half miles long, the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam creates the shortest pool on the Mississippi River. The dam is the fourth highest. However, the pool sees the greatest drop over the shortest distance of any of the reservoirs. But again, the reservoir masks the drop. Keeping the locks and dams then means the physical appearance of the gorge will not change. We can't see the biggest changes happening right now, which are coming from the end of navigation. No towboats and barges run the gorge. No massive propellers stir up the river bottom. The core has stopped dredging the nine foot channel and the once incised river bottom is filling in and leveling out. Fewer recreational craft use the gorge today than before the Upper Sandy Falls Lock closed. And this is in part because the core has cut back hours of operation at the Lower Sandy Falls Lock and Dam and at Lock and Dam number one. And when the core leaves altogether, the locks will close. And it's unlikely that anybody else is gonna to wanna to run or operate or pay for those locks. Fewer people fish from the shore above Lock and Dam 1 compared the number of people who fish below it where the current is stronger. I imagine the Minneapolis and the U of M rowing clubs and those who still boat in the gorge are enjoying the end of navigation. Overall, we need good surveys of how the gorge is used and by whom right now. We do not know much about the ecological responses to the end of navigation. We can assume that the fishery will remain the same in each pool there will likely be a limited number of species as there are today. Mussels may benefit from the shallower river and no commercial traffic or dredging disturbing their habitat, but species diversity will likely stay the same there as well. 
water quality will stay the same as well. Much of the gorge is impaired for bacteria, except for the river immediately below the upper and lower St. Paul's locks and dam, where the water where the, the water coming over the spillway stirs up the current and therefore oxygenates the water, which helps to kill the bacteria. We need to studies to identify and quantify the environmental changes taking place in the gorge, and not just in the near term. What will the gorge become after 10, 20, 30 years without dredging in barges and tows if the dams are left in place? Knowing the exact cost of remaining at both sites is also critical. What are the annual and long-term costs and who would have to bear what portions of those costs once the core leaves? As I mentioned, after locks and dams are deauthorized and disposed of, it's not clear whether Brookville would have to stay at one or, or will stay at one or both sides. And we don't know what all they would have to take maintenance responsibility for, or if they would be responsible for what they have now. Brookfield benefits most from the dams. At a minimum, will they have to take over the dams? And if not Brookfield, who? And who could and would take what they don't take? No one will want some of the structural elements. For example, I doubt anyone will want to take and maintain the 800 foot long retaining wall at Lock and Dam 1 that supports the bluff below the, below the Minnesota Veterans Home. Unless Brookfield takes everything at both sites, it seems clear that the locks and dams and related infrastructure can't be left in place without a viable adaptive reuse. If Brookfield stays, how else would anyone use those portions of the locks that it doesn't take? If Brookfield leaves one or both sites, finding other uses becomes even more important and necessary. They just can't sit there abandoned. From an aesthetic standpoint, the reservoirs are like lakes and have an aesthetic appeal. Both locks and dams are highly visible in, and they're in highly sensitive areas. Whatever happens at these sites, we, they must be kept up so we don't, they don't become derelict eyesores. And any new uses must respect the context. For pool one, whoops, second. Both sites, sorry, both lights lie within the boundaries of the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area and come under the Mississippi River Corridor Critical Area rules. How diverse are the current users of the gorge? And what do they use the gorge for? This is a critical social matter. Who would lose what if the dams were removed? I'm sure I've missed many important considerations that those for or against keeping the locks and dams will point out. Please do so in the chat. This, is a, this conversation is really just beginning. And we want to consider everything, but I can't cover everything here. Now let's look at removing Lock and Dam 1 and the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam. The Lower St. Anthony Falls Reservoir has, as I mentioned, the greatest drop over the shortest distance, which means a robust rapids will emerge as soon as the reservoir is drained. For this pool, we had a drawdowns in 2008 and 2020, which give us a good idea of what the river might look like. We have lots of historic photographs. In 2020, the Corps lowered the pool by 12 feet, but the total drop there is 26 feet. So we need to visualize what a full drop could look like. And we have lots of historic photographs that can give us a good idea of that. For pool one, we have one drawdown event to help us to help with recovery efforts after the 35 bridge collapse in 2007, the Corps lowered pool one by five to six feet. These images give us good hints of what we might see, such as limestone boulders still present along the shore, and sandbars like the bar forming at the Marshall Avenue Bridge, where there was once an island. The Meeker Island Lock and Dam will stand out. It is a nationally significant historic site, and we have to consider what becomes of it. It could be both a hazard and an amenity. And we have lots of historic images for this pool. Much, but not all of the river's physical characters of the gorge could come back and some of what the Corps took out could be put back. I have to show you this table. It captures the average monthly flow at a gauge about 11 miles above St. Anthony Falls from June, 30, June 1931 to September 2019. Don't try read the numbers. I want you to focus on the colors and the seasons. Oranges indicate flows below, below 5,000 cubic feet per second in blue flows, those above 15,000. No significant rivers come in the Mississippi River below this gauge. So this is a reflection 
of how much water flows over the falls and through the gorge. And today this variability is masked by the reservoirs. You remove the lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam and Lock and Dam 1. And from St. Anthony Falls to the Marshall Avenue Bridge, you would see a rapids and some small islands. Below the bridge would be a rapids, few rapids, but you'd also see a swiftly running river and more and larger islands. And all this would change with the seasons and the years. Recreational users will have access to eight and a half miles of restored river, now largely segmented by the two locks and dams. People will be able to take whitewater kayaks or rafts down when the river is high, or you could float down in the inner tubes when the river is low. I took the Boise River image on a 105 degree day there. The six mile recreational portion of the river through Boise, Idaho runs past Boise State University in commercial and residential areas. We could see similar recreational use in the gorge. And we could talk to people in Boise, Idaho and other cities about any issues they've identified. As we saw in October 2020, people will gather on the beaches and wade in the river. Many fish species, especially game fish, will return to the gorge, which means that there are going to be more anglers both along the beaches and fishing in the gorge. And more fishing boats will be able to get up the gorge with the dam gone. American Rivers has begun developing their campaign, as I said, to restore the gorge. And this is their image of what might come back. Again, at this time, I'm not taking an official position one way or the other. The rock, gravel, and sand riverbed would again become important fish spawning habitat. And we see more species of fish and consequently more species of mussels. More fish would mean more eagles along the gorge, nesting or maybe hunting in the gorge. And water quality would likely improve, improve with the oxidation that comes with rapids. We would lose Brookfield hydroelectric energy stations, both of them, and hydroelectric power is a renewable energy source. But we can't confuse it with green energy. Dams do disrupt rivers. Dam removal would require a substantial one-time cost, but it would be a one-time cost versus having to pay indefinitely every year for these structures. Who would pay for dam removal? How much would it be? We need to figure this out. Not only Will there be cost from removing the locks and dams? We have to consider how much infrastructure is going to need retrofitting. And even with keeping the, as with keeping the locks and dams, we have to think about adaptive reuses for maybe some of the structures on those sites. The aesthetic character of the river below St. Anthony Falls would change dramatically, as demonstrated by the 2020 drawdown. But the lower pool doesn't really have that lake like appearance as it does downstream. The river, especially below the Lower St. Anthony Falls Lock and Dam, probably would look ugly to some, and it would take many years to clean up and restore the gorge and retrofit the infrastructure along it. You would lose the lake look, but we have lots of lakes. The gorge would be one of the most unique water bodies in the region. The natural river's appearance would change with the seasons and the years. We also need to consider the diversity of users of a restored gorge would draw. What would draw them and why? American Rivers has produced a study entitled The Impact of Dam Removal on Black, Indigenous, and People of Color in the Path Towards Equity that can help us consider what dam removal could mean here. But we knew, do need to make this study specific to this gorge and these cities. And what are the critical key concerns about dam removal? Well, there's a lot. Sediment, pollutants, the Mekong Lock and Dam remnants, Storm sewer outfalls, retaining walls, neighborhood impacts, existing users, safety, invasive species, a lot we have to consider. The river we have today, however, is a product of visions of people from the past that they handed down to us. We can't and shouldn't live with their legacies because we are at a different time in history. We have to define our visions, our needs, and our values for this moment. Whatever we choose, it should come after a very broad and deep conversation. I want to show you this slide, which has website information for some of the key partners I've mentioned in my presentation. Friends of Mississippi River, American Rivers, and the National Parks Conservation Association. And also, uh, I'm hoping these are going to be posted in the chat by McAllister. These are links to a survey that you can, that survey I mentioned that will get 
try to get opinion, public opinion about ideas for the future of the gorge and, and the current disposition study. So with that, I want to turn it over to John Shepard. And I need to stop sharing my screen. There you go, John. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, John. That is an amazing tale. Um, terrific detail and uh, background, uh, raising some really, really interesting questions and issues. So that is just wonderful. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes to share a, a few of our educational resources that we have that are related uh, to the content that uh, John has been talking about. Um, and I'm going to start with this one. This is a, a learning module we have created that's called Confluence. Uh, and it really focuses on the Minnesota uh, Mississippi River Confluence area, also known as Bedote. Um, and this is a kind of a go deeper exploration of this very important uh, area that includes uh, at the top of the map here, uh, you can see the uh, Lock and Dam number one, the Ford Dam, uh, and we do have content related to that as well. So this is an opportunity, this particular module, to kind of explore this particular area, its importance uh, to our community from a number of different perspectives. And an important one that I would just mention is uh, the, the fact that Bidote, which is a Dakota word for confluence, uh, is uh, the, this, that is a general word for a confluence, but this particular one is considered to be a sacred and a very important place for um, our Dakota uh, community um, here in the Twin Cities area. So we worked with the uh, Lower Phelan Creek Project uh, to put together a learning experience that focuses on important places uh, in Dakota culture along the Mississippi River. And I'm not gonna go into this because we don't really have time, but you will get a link to this that you can explore on your own. There's an opening video that introduces um, place names, Dakota place names in Minnesota and how many, many there are in the uh, Twin Cities area, but elsewhere as well. And then once you've uh, either looked at that or skipped past it as I just did, um, what you're looking at is an interactive map produced by uh, Marlena Miles, a Dakota artist that uh, has place names of importance uh, within Dakota culture. And all the ones that are circled in red are places where we have stories. So there are 15 videos integrated into this, uh, into this learning module that are either curated by uh, video producers uh, in the Dakota community and a few that we made ourselves working with our Dakota partners, uh, Lower Phelan Creek um, and um, Mittawakanton uh, uh, Shakopee uh, tribe as well. And uh, you'll see that uh, St. Anthony Falls is included here. So there's a video about that. We also focus on the names of the places. And if you click on these different links, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll hear them pronounced correctly in Dakota. So this is a, an important module. I'm gonna close that out. We'll go back to this scene. There's a section on testing water quality. There's a section on birds of prey, uh, but we're gonna jump up to the uh, Lock and Dam number one and see what we can find here. So here you get an aerial view of the Lock and Dam. This is one of the ones that John was just talking about. And one of the things we look at is how this changes in periods of time of high and low water. And you can see that island uh, below the lock as I toggle back and forth <clears throat> changes considerably uh, in terms of how much vegetation is visible at high water. And we're gonna explore that a little bit more. There's also uh, icons here you can click that have information about different parts of the scene, about the dam and the powerhouse, uh, the lock and dam itself and the site of the Ford plant historically that was located there. So you can explore that. Uh, and then we have two more pieces. We have an island walkabout where you actually uh, get a chance to explore this island through a series of panoramas. And one of the things you'll note 
the upstream end of the island, which is what we're looking at right now in this 360 panorama, it has a very gravelly appearance. If I go down to the lower end of the island, it's all fine sediment. Interesting. Why would that be different? And how would the dynamics of water flowing downstream of the waterfall uh, bring that about? Then we have a 360 video walkthrough uh, that you can explore. Um, I'm gonna go back out though and show you the, the piece that is also of interest that really focuses on the lock itself. And we actually have an interaction uh, called the, we have a 360 video time-lapse of going through the lock. And then we have an interactive, um, scenario where you are acting as the lock master and you have to figure out how to get barges uh, through the locks, uh, through, through the lock here, going from upstream to downstream initially and then sending one back upstream. And you have to figure out the correct sequence of opening and closing these gates. So a fun interactive that really uh, replicates the functioning of uh, the lock and dams. So that is our piece called Confluence. Uh, the other one I want to show you is, uh, was also referenced by John, and this is focused uh, at uh, St. Anthony Falls. You can see the, the falls themselves in the upper left, and the upper lock is located here. And um, what we did here was this part of this was made on the occasion of the drawdown uh, that happened in October 2020. And you can see this yellow dotted line that shows the area of the river bottom that was exposed during that drawdown. And all of the links that are in yellow are images taken during that period of time. <clears throat> we also have a, a drone video that I was able to make uh, at that location, uh, flying up the rapids um, during the drawdown and taking a look at how the, uh, the drawdown changed this appearance. So this would actually be a useful resource to think about some of the questions that John was raising. You know, what, uh, again, it, this is not as much of a drawdown as would occur if the uh, lower um, uh, dam were removed, but it, it gives you a sense of, of um, being able to think about some of these issues. The th there's a series of 360 panoramas made uh, at different locations uh, where you can examine uh, you know, what's uh, revealed here as the, the, the floodwaters uh, or the, the higher water created by um, the dam uh, was, was eliminated. Uh, and then there's a photo gallery there as well. And we have uh, other media that we have produced previously. So we have a, another interactive 360 video uh, that is made at the, uh, the lock and dam itself uh, the upper upper falls, and and this enables you to kind of see what's here presently. We have the stone arch bridge down below. There's information pop-ups that talk about different aspects of the scene. Um, so this is a resource that's uh, part of this as well, um, and uh, historic uh, image gallery. Um, and then uh, a, a short video that, that chronicles the geologic history of uh, St. Anthony Falls. And it follows its migration uh, 11,000 years ago from where it was located at that time, which was close to where downtown St. Paul is today. And at a breathtaking pace of, I think it's about six feet per year on average, that waterfall has migrated upstream due to the particular um, uh, character of the, the uh, bedrock uh, in this area, the limestone and sandstone bedrock <clears throat> that enabled the falls to actually erode very quickly as it moved upstream to its current location. So that, that's called the waterfall on the move. There's another video called the waterfall that built a city um, and then uh, image gallery of, the, of St. Anthony Falls through time. So these two learning mod modules would be relevant to this whole discussion and they are free and uh, we will put those links, I'll put those links in the uh, chat. I'll tr stop sharing my screen right now and we can take some time for questions, of which I'm guessing there will be some. Tracy, are you going to manage that? I am going I am going to manage the questions and we had a couple. I'm going to start from the beginning of those. Uh, but uh, uh, first, I wanted to say, uh, Doug had mentioned that, boy, this is kind of confusing. There's lots of which, where is the dam? What, how do you put this all together? 
And that's one of the ways that we uh, at Hamlin like to use these tools to make the invisible visible or to put context to these components, because it's very rich. There's a lot of things going on and the general public doesn't tend to want to take a lot of time to understand them. So I think the tools we have made can help do that. Uh, still more needs to be done, uh, but uh, those are at least some starts with the tools. Uh, so we're going to get started with the questions. We got about 15 minutes or so. I think we'll have a chance to get to all of them. Uh, so the first one is from Erica about uh, the role of Spirit Island and the confluence of the two rivers to the Dakota and Ojibwa people. And uh, when was the Spirit Island flooded out? Uh, uh, which which was which uh, which uh, project flooded out Spirit Island? So first question. Well, I can take that, John. If you want to add some in as well, <clears throat> the island was initially it was mined. That's the first part of taking apart. Was a lot of the limestone was mined off the island in the early nineteen hundred, late eighteen hundreds, and early nineteen hundreds. But it was still there even after the it, um, completion of the Lower Saint Falls. Lock and Dam in 1956. It didn't flood it, it just put it in deeper water. But when they built the upper lock, the island was in the way of the channel. And so when they come between, you know, when they started building the upper lock in 1963, when they opened it, they pretty much took out the rest of the island. Part of it might be under a, the outdraft barrier, but mostly it's gone. So it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s when it was taken out. And what role did it play with the with the native folks that were here uh, uh, prior to white white uh, white settlement? You know, I I don't have information on that, and I would I would hate to try speak for it, but I will say this: that you know, Jonathan Carver in 1766 said it was there are all kinds of eagles' nests at that site uh, in, on that island, and eagles can only be there in such density if there's an immense amount of food. So it, it must have been an an, an incredible place with that many eagles nests on one small island. All right, I believe this question was answered, but just to be uh, consistent, uh, uh, the question was, what was Brookfield? And uh, uh, I think it uh, was clearly answered that it's licensed, uh, Brookfield Power Company licensed by FERC for hydropower, but can you talk more about their their agreement? How long of a contract do they have? What, what does it take to buy them out? A lot of questions there. So, so Brookfield Energy is a Canadian company, and, and look them up. They are a huge international power company of renewable energy types in particular. And they have the licenses at both Upper and Lower San Anthony Falls, locks and dams. I believe one of those runs out in about 2032 or three at, at Lock and Dam 1. That's rough estimate, but pretty close. And the one for Lower San Anthony, I think, is 2050 ish. So they would have to be bought out or the question becomes for them really is can the core you know tell them we're leaving um, you need to take over the maintenance of the dam or other things and does that make it affordable to Brookfield anymore? But again that's you know once this really get Brookfield's probably not going to decide that until they're put on the spot they have to decide that. All right, thank you. Uh, here's a question from Emily. Uh, what would happen with invasive carp dispersal if the dams were removed? You know, that's a, that's a good question. And I just attended the Minnesota Aquatic and Species, Species Research Center's um, recent forum where they have lots of presentations and I sit on their citizen advisory board as well. And one of the presidents in pre presentations in particular made the point that restoring native habitat is one of the best tools to stave off invasive species. And that was really becoming clear. We can do lots of things, but if we don't, if we if they don't have good habitat, it's gonna be hard to, to stop invasive species. So the habitat restoration is one of the best things we can do. And the other the component, they're not talking about taking out the upper lock. Uh, so that is another barrier. So if even we take out the lower two, there is the upper barrier uh, for, uh, for invasive species going above the falls, correct? Correct, the upper, at, at St. Anthony Falls, the core only owns a small part of the dam and the lock. Excel Energy owns most of the dam. And, and again, if you took out the dam there, St. Anthony Falls would disappear. I think we have a few questions about that in a little bit, but uh, uh, let's see, here's a question about uh, what is the impact on water quality and what is your recommendation for shoreline restoration? 
that we had seen in northern parts uh, of the river restored after the logging industry uh, destruction sea. So um, water quality and uh, shoreline restoration in that part. Well, water quality, of course, is a is a huge issue. Um, again, John, weigh in on any of this you want to weigh in on. Um, it's a huge issue. Uh, the gorge and, and the river above are impaired for bacteria. And so we need to stop storm sewers from bringing bacteria into the, into the river. The, like I said, the oxygenation of the water in the rapids actually helps kill bacteria. So the more rapids you have, the cleaner the water gets, but still the bacteria is there. We have to stop it at its source. And in terms of shoreland restoration, you know, the shore is pretty stable with the current lock and dam system. If you take out the locks and dams, the river is going to really start sculpting a new, a new channel. If we, we'll get back a dozen islands or more in the gorge, and some will be more permanent than others. As you saw with John's video, the, dam, the island below the lock and dam one, at times it'll be underwater and at times it won't be. That kind of opens up this next question uh, from Anne, which is, uh, will the river flood more or less? You know, that's a, that's a common question we get. And, and what you have to think about is you look at St. Anthony Falls and you look at Lock and Dam 1, they're both fixed crest spillways. Consider them the edge of your bathtub, okay? You filled your bathtub up with water and now you've got the spigot set at a certain level and water starts going over the edge of the bathtub. Well, that's what St. Anthony Falls is. Whatever water comes in above St. Anthony Falls is, is flowing over the spillway. It's flowing over the edge of the bathtub. So there won't be more flooding or less. It'll be the water, the flow of, on that table I showed you of the, on the, of the gauges, that gauge, it'll be the same as that. The water coming in is what goes over and through. Does that make Got sense? <laughs> Um, clear. I'm going to focus a bit. There are some questions kind of about the, the upper dam. And um, uh, I think I know we talked about you could give it a whole nother uh, hour presentation about the upper dam, which you didn't even really talk about. Uh, I don't think you would say. So here's a question. Uh, Dr. Amphenson mentioned that, that the dam could not be removed from upper St. Anthony Falls. Could you please explain, could the falls be restored there? That would be very hard, and, and I have a whole other presentation I've worked on very hard that's ready to go ab about that. Um, so, so right now it's the concrete spillway. The, John, I think that video you have, it'd be great if people went and looked at the retreat of the falls. The falls are literally one tick of the geologic clock from ending. You take off the dam, and you take off the spillway cover, and the falls would finish deterioration probably and just go away. You could restore it. The Corps of Engineers builds incredible things. Um, they could probably re-engineer a fake falls <laughs> and make it look like a, a natural falls, but it, it would be an engineered structure. That kind of answers a question from Patrick about what happens if the, uh, if the dam were removed. Um, this is one I'm, I'm not sure I quite understand, but I will throw it out in the honor of on, honoring all questions. Uh, the retrofit of infrastructure, would you define, is that human retrofit or biome retrofit? I'm talking about human retrofit. You know, I, I got to canoe the gorge when they did that five or six foot drawdown. And it was interesting to see that, you know, the number of storm sewer outlets in the gorge that just kind of hang out there and look really ugly. So, and, even, and the outflow started cutting channels through the bars. So we'd have to deal with those. And you think of the University of Minnesota's West Bank, for those who know that, there's a big uh, sheet pile retaining wall there. And at Riverside Park down river, there's a big concrete retaining wall. Those retaining walls would be way out of the river now and be, would become great billboards for targeting, I mean, for tagging or, or deterioration. So there might have to be landscaping done to landscape down to the river in some of those areas. In other places, we just have to, again, what I'm trying to introduce people to in this talk is all the things we need to think about and consider, both with keeping them and with taking them out. Here's another very simple question. Would uh, they would like to share this presentation? And as we stated, yes, we will have this available. 
And I think the important thing that John brought out, Anfinson, Dr. Anfinson brought out is, this is the beginning of a conversation that we can all be engaged with. There, there isn't a right answer, there will be an answer, but it is not one that is so much driven by, I don't believe as science as the civics. Uh, what do we envision as a community for our, uh, our, our river environment? Um, uh, let's see, this is one, there's two left, so we're getting close to the end. What's the worst that could happen if the dams were removed and the river was left to its natural flow? Wow, I, tough question. <laughs> what's the worst? Because I think it's what's the best could, that could happen. I mean, people are raising issues about what's in the sediment. What kind of pollutants might there be in the sediment that's released? Where would the sediment go? How would it affect navigation downstream? How would it affect water quality downstream? Those are all things we have to, we have to think about. There could be, you know, other impacts of um, maybe the gorges get so overused and people you know, come down there and there's there's all kinds of nuisance issues that we haven't thought about. But I think we'll anticipate those. That's why that's why we need this conversation. That's why we need inputs to the chat. That's why we need people to respond to McAllister's survey and look at Hamlin's website with all that great information that you've put up about the gorge. So the more we can learn, the better. There's gonna be, like I say, more a lot more conversations about this. I've uh, got a question from Joe that he's talking about uh, in the last 10 years, he's experienced a, a major floods of 200 year flood events um, and his home is on the bluffs. Uh, questions just about the flooding and ravines. Um, just, uh, I think it's kind of a broader, maybe even a climate change question you might say about the, well, the changing uh, of the water patterns uh, flow. Uh, what do you, do you see any issues with uh, changing of, of rain patterns, precipitation patterns, uh, and its impact on, on the gorge or just on, uh, on uh, bluffs in general? You know, it's, it's not going to impact the gorge and the bluffs there so much. You know, I think the, one of the key issues is if the Corps deauthorizes and disposes of the dams and they're not taken care of, they will eventually fail. It's happened on the Green River in Kentucky and other places. So, you know, you get a, you get a, a dam that's not well maintained and then you get a major climate change flood like we've seen in Germany or China or other places, how much more at risk are those dams if they're not really taken care of well? That, that would concern me and it, it should concern, you know, people at St. Anthony Falls as well. Uh, uh, the flood of record at St. Anthony Falls in a, single day was 91,000 cubic feet per second, but, which is a lot. Could we see something far more? And here's the final question um, that, that I will take right now because we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, it seems, uh, the question is, uh, uh, it seems like the indigenous Dakota people should lead the conversation and make those decisions since the land is theirs and uh, they are its best stewards. Uh, I guess you might say, uh, how can we get more diverse voices and maybe who has say uh, and standing and voice in these conversations? So the Corps of Engineers has to, you know, lead this disposition study. And as they are at the upper St. Anthony Falls Lock, they're already engaging tribes, multiple tribes in this conversation, including the Dakota. And they will have to do the same thing for this study, especially if it's a full impact uh, you know, environmental impact statement study, or, or whether it, what kind of study it is or not, they're going to have to engage the federally recognized Indian tribes in this conversation. And and I think the the voice of the Dakota and, and other tribes, especially the Dakota, are going to be very very strong in this conversation. Got it. Well, I know I thought that was the last question, but a few more have come in. I think we can take them, but. Uh, these are the last ones. So let me, let me ask you a question, Tracy, real course. quick. Are you capturing the chat so that that can be shared later? Um, I yeah. believe Sarah's nodding yes. <laughs> Good. That's what I was hoping. Okay. I, just, I um, want to make sure. How many stormwater pipes pour into the river in the Twin Cities? You know, I, I saw Randy Naprash on this. <laughs> um, this. Uh, webinar so or this this uh, talk so i need an expert on that not me i'm not an expert on that 
I'm going to put in a pitch for the adopt a drain program. Uh, over 9,100 people have adopted uh, a, a, a drain in their neighborhood, uh, becoming a steward uh, in the Twin Cities. Uh, the, the next highest one is about maybe uh, at 2,000 in the city of San Francisco. So uh, we've done great work uh, in the Twin Cities doing this. So uh, let's just say it's not so many how many storm drain pipes come in, all of them come in. All of the water that flows off of the urban setting flows into the Mississippi River. I mean, it's as clean as clear as that. It's it's all of them. Um, we're going to take a look at. Uh, let's see. Uh, how high did the water rise at the biggest flood? So the so the record flood for the gorge is the 1965 flood, and like I said, during the 1965 flood. The, the, the greatest flow is 91,000 cubic feet per second. To give you some context, the Corps of Engineers opens the gates at Upper St. Anthony Falls lock to pass excess flood flows when it gets to 50,000 cubic feet per second. They've only done that five times or six times since 1963. And so at 50,000 cubic feet per second, they're trying to bypass as much water as they can around the falls and, and the uh, during the flood is almost twice as much. So it's it's pretty immense. But in the go but but above the above the falls, it didn't flood much. People weren't sandbagging up in Champlain because the, the watershed there just isn't that big above St. Anthony. Okay, this is the last question. A uh, paved trail on the Mississippi River Boulevard in St. Paul is sloped towards the river and new paving cracks quickly. Will the banks continue to fall into the river and making uh, to, and make maintaining the trails feasible? Oh, we, I'm sorry, I just, I caught a chat that popped up on my screen from Nan Bishop regarding the 65 flood, which may add some information. So can you repeat the question? Okay, we'll go with that for uh, this uh, question uh, is uh, about uh, the paved trails on the Mississippi River Boulevard in St. Paul is sloped towards the river and new paving cracks quickly. Will the banks continue to fall into the river, uh, making the trails feasible? This is a good infrastructure question that's out there for any of our trails and, and roads, but especially the trails along the river on the, on the Minneapolis side as well. Yeah, for the, for the gourd, I mean, for the, for, I think they're talking about down in Crosby Park uh, mm -hmm. in particular, um, that flooding has been due primarily to the Minnesota River. Uh, rising as well as you know contributing from the Mississippi too, but that will stay the same. That's I mean the amount of water, like I said, that goes over Lock and Dam One is going to be not going to change. The same amount is going to be going over or through the river at that point, whether the dam's there or not, and probably at the same speed. Fantastic. Well, with that, we are going to close this up, and I want to thank uh, uh, John Enfinson and John Shepard for sharing. A uh, fantastic opportunity. I know that John has a little more to say about uh, an interesting opportunity that is happening, and uh, we are going to be wrapping this up in about two minutes. So, John, take us uh, take us out. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, kind of a related matter that we thought everybody might want to hear more about. Um, uh, Betty McCollum, uh, the congressional representative uh, representing St. Paul, has initiated a new bit of legislation called the Mississippi River Restoration and Resilience Initiative. And you can see the broad strokes uh, bulleted there on the left. Uh, basically, this would establish um, a national Mississippi River program office. And the, you could think of this as elevating the Mississippi River from the headwaters to the Gulf to the same level of importance from the federal government standpoint as places like the Everglades and the Great Lakes, uh, and Chesapeake Bay. Uh, so you've got multiple federal agencies working on the river and not always, or perhaps not frequently, working in harmony. So this national office would work to coordinate some of that work among federal agencies, but it would also be, it's non-regulatory, so it's not about uh, slapping uh, anybody with new regulations. It's about providing funding for projects that are locally sourced. So uh, through a network of participating organizations, there would be opportunities for people to propose 
uh, projects and receive funding uh, initially pegged at $300 million a year uh, once it kicks off. And the priority issues that are uh, targeted for the legislation are water quality, wildlife habitat and invasive species, and climate resilience. So this is a bill that is just being introduced uh, and we are, our center is involved in making a video that would be used in Congress to help uh, build support for the measure. Uh, there's a web address at the bottom there that I just also just put in the chat. If you're interested in learning more or getting on a mailing list to be kept apprised of what's happening, um, you can click on that link. It's for Friends of the Mississippi who are uh, some of the key folks organizing this. So wanted to be sure you knew about that. Um, and then I think, Sarah, do you have some things to say about our concluding slide here? Yeah, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you are interested uh, in getting uh, one and a half continuing education units, uh, go to the tiny URL that is there. I'll also include it in my follow-up email uh, that we have from tonight, which will include all of the links from the chats, um, as well as the uh, video recording uh, of this of this webinar. Um, we have an upcoming uh, December 7th webinar, which is featuring Michael Hopkins and uh, focusing on hurricanes in the Mississippi River Delta. Um, so I will send out a link to that as well. We'd love to have everyone join us. And we have a uh, Mississippi River Delta Institute coming up in January and February on Tuesday nights for five nights, uh, for five weeks that we would love to invite people to join as well. And we'll send that information as well. With that, I think we can uh, wrap this up. Uh, if people want to stay and, and, uh, and, and chat a little bit, uh, we will keep this going, but the uh, program is officially over and uh, we can uh, uh, stay around and, and have a bit more conversation. Uh, I hope you can join us next December, or this December, excuse me, because our presenter is uh, will be the John Anfinson of the South around hurricanes. He knows a lot about hurricanes, and uh, we, really, uh, we have learned so much as we started doing our work down there. It's a remarkable place. So uh, if you're interested in expanding your understanding of the Gulf Coast and the troubles and tribulations and opportunities that they face, we really do enjoy uh, encourage you to join us for that. So. Thank you so very much. And with that, uh, we'll let uh, people take off and uh, thank you very much.